We are so excited to have all of you here today. Um, everyone has already been talking about how warm the room feels, literally and figuratively, <laughs> but we want to welcome you to our 2019 MLK March and Celebration. I'm like, whew, the day has come. We are so thankful to have you all here today to celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This is our first year having activities suspended during the celebration to ensure that all employees and students on campus would be free to attend this event. Let's give a round of applause for that. I would like to thank our Student Senate for bringing this concern to our attention. And then also, I want to thank the Cabinet for being willing to listen and also make this celebratory change. So thank you. Today is important because we will take the opportunity to march around our campus and symbolically honor the sacrifices of so many people in our nation during the Civil Rights Movement. I stand here on their shoulders today in front of you all. I also hope that you use this celebration as motivation to continue the work that Dr. King started. We all have the responsibility to make our world and nation a place where we are all treated as valuable parts of God's kingdom. I hope that you leave and you are motivated to be a part of the continued progress during a time when our nation sometimes feels more divided than ever. Today we will wear our pins. Hope you all have one on. They all say AQ Unite on them. As a community, we will decide that we are one family and we are all dedicated to making sure every member of our family can call this place home. This event is also the kickoff for St. Thomas Aquinas Week. So I hope you're all excited about all of our events we have coming up. As we celebrate the namesake of our institution, we thought it would be important to highlight the work of our Dominican sisters. If you have never sat with one of them and learned about their journeys, you are truly missing out, and I encourage you to do that at some point during this week's events. There are, they are truly inspiring women. I would like to invite Sister Marianne Barrett up to tell us more about the historical connection of the sisters to social justice and human rights movements. Please welcome Sister Marianne. So as you look to your right and your left, you notice there are a lot of preachers here. <laughs> preachers who, with their words, preachers with their gestures, preachers with their stances, and preachers in their silence who all speak volumes. So St. Dominic de Guzman was the founder of the order of preachers, the Dominicans. And the guiding light for the Dominicans is the word of God, scripture. Down through the centuries, there have been many women all over the world, people like Bartolome de las Casas, Martin de Porres, Rose of Lima, and those of us contemporaries today who have contemplated that word of God, who studied it, prayed it, and sought to live it with integrity. So we Dominicans are committed to lifelong transformation and conversion because the integrity is not always present. So like Martin Luther King Jr., we Dominican Sisters of Grand Rapids have always sought truth. Truth about who we are, whose we are, our mission and purpose here on Earth. We've sought the truth about our role as advocates of justice and human rights. We've sought truth about our stewardship of both our personal gifts as well as the environmental gifts. So we've spoken out to power, to authority, to those with diverse perspectives, and always in a spirit of dialogue. In the 1960s, you can see this wonderful picture. <laughs> it, it might come up later. In 1960s, the sister faculty here at Aquinas joined the marchers in Grand Rapids when the young black schoolgirls, Cynthia, Carol, Addie Mae, and Denise, were killed during Sunday services 
in Birmingham. The sisters marched in Grand Rapids after the death of Martin Luther King Jr., walking from Garfield Park to downtown where there was a prayer service. So in honor of Martin Luther King Jr., a man of the gospel, a man of justice and nonviolence, we pray that our, cons our um, institutional voice and our personal voices and our leadership skills will all be used to work on behalf of those for whom justice has been denied and human rights have been denied. So let us raise our voices in praise of nonviolence and justice for all. Thank you. I realized that I never told you all who I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> that would have been a great place to start with our welcome. So please forgive my brain for forgetting that key fact. My name is Alicia Lloyd, and I'm the director of the Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity on campus. And I also am special advisor to the president as well. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> And now, before we start our march, we're going to have Father Stan come up and pray for us. And then after he prays, I'll come up and give you instructions for the march. Thank you. Thank you. God of all goodness, we praise and thank you for you send into our lives women and men to challenge us prophetically. In doing so, they offer us the opportunity to become more perfectly your sons and daughters. They show us how to live in justice, in proper relationship to you and with each other. We recognize you as God and source of all. We recognize ourselves as your servants. We also celebrate all your children, our brothers and sisters, as equal in nature and diversity in manifold beauty. Today, we celebrate and recognize Dr. Martin Luther King, one of the greatest prophets and martyrs of our age. His teachings and actions continue to challenge us to be more perfectly your children. Allow us to love as he loved, to serve as he served, and to commit ourselves to true and perfect justice and peace in our world among all peoples. May we open our arms widely, as he did, to embrace all your children as our brothers and sisters. And may we, in the example of Dr. King, boldly proclaim in word and action your desire that all will be one. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the time has come. I hope that you have all dressed warmly and you are ready to go out and begin our march. Um, I want you all to know that we have a Snapchat filter so please, please, please use your Snapchat while you're on your march and use our filter. We also have the hashtag that you can't forget because it's on your pin. <laughs> so everybody look down. If you're posting on Instagram or Facebook, please use the hashtag so we're able to see your wonderful pictures throughout the whole event. We would love to be able to capture those. So please use those for us. All right, our diversity assistants will be leading the way for the march. I am pretty sure they are by the door and ready for you all. So if you can line up behind them, they will lead the way for the journey around campus. And we'll see you back here with lots of warm beverages. The fireplace will still be going and we'll have our amazing speaker. Thank you all.
Welcome everyone. My name is Emma Robertson and I'm a diversity assistant for the Center for Diversity, Inclusion and Equity. I would like to thank you all for joining Aquinas College and the Center for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion as we remember and celebrate the prolific work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. During his life, Dr. King embodied many roles, husband, father, friend, civil rights leader, prisoner, demonstrator, but regardless of which role he played, it was always apparent that he was a preacher, a man of God. Dr. King's faith spurred his lifelong march toward justice and gave him strength in hard times. So it was only fitting that we have welcomed a fellow religious leader, Pastor Jermone Glenn, to speak with us today. Pastor Glenn is the enigmatic leader of the Revolution Culture Movement, located here on the southeast side of Grand Rapids. He is a native of Chicago and began his ministry at the age of 21, working to enrich the lives of young people through ministry. Pastor Glenn has worked as a teacher and curriculum developer for the Chicago Public Schools and continues to show his investment in our community through his participation in many local community organizations focused on education, social justice, equity, and spiritual development. His decades of service to his congregations and communities are a testament to the life of Dr. King and set an example of how Dr. King's legacy continues to manage itself today. It is my very great pleasure to welcome to the stage Pastor Jermone Glenn. I guess I brought my own crew, huh? <laughs> when in doubt. Good to be with you today, um, to see so many beautiful people, um, so many diverse faces. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to share with you on this uh, occasion uh, to all the faculty and staff. Miss Alicia, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, we're going to, uh, while you're warming up from that march, we're going to uh, dig into a little bit of uh, what I'm calling the, the blueprint dealing with the life and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, long before the hip hop mogul, Jay-Z penned the, the, the uh, CD project called The Blueprint, uh, a little known, a lesser known speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called The Blueprint was penned and spoken six months before his assassination. Six months before his assassination, he spoke to a room full of students. And in him speaking to them, he challenged them and asked them the prolific question, what is your blueprint? Uh, today, uh, although we celebrate the past and, 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 and journey through it, uh, today, in, in efforts to continue that conversation, I join with Dr. Martin Luther King today to ask you the question, what is your blueprint? Uh, every one of us, each and every last one of us, was given a reason why we were born or created. It is our responsibility then to discover that reason why we're on the earth. It's called purpose. Uh, questions like, who am I, which speaks to your identity. What do I have, which makes you wrestle with your skill set or your inventory. What am I to do? or the intentions, or the motive, or the direction of your life are all de determining factors into the contribution that you will add to this very important conversation. Uh, number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your worth, and your own somebodiness is the first statement that Dr. Martin Luther King made in this important conversation. See, it's critical in your identity to recognize your design. Each and every one of us was made in the image and the likeness of God. When God created us in his image and in his likeness, he gave us the responsibility to develop our lives according to that pattern or that blueprint so that we can have significant contribution. Not just make Dr. Martin Luther King's life and work and legacy iconic, although it was, but also that it is inspiring that we live our best lives and our highest self. 
uh, when you when you when you when you think about this, um, uh, God in fact determined your design. He determined your design, but your decisions determine your destiny. It is making or being made in the image or the likeness of God that gives you the ability to uh, to follow after that pattern of creation. But yet and still, it is your decisions and what you decide to do with your skill set that allows you to decide or determine the path that you will find. Uh, you are innately born, created, to do something that you've never done before. It is your human responsibility to make sure that you add to the communication or the dialogue that exists. Uh, you, in fact, were designed to lead. God created you to lead, and in leading in his likeness and in his ability, you have to decide what you will lead. Leadership, then, is determined by how you serve or benefit other people. This is like the picture that we see when we think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his life. It's a picture of leadership, a life lived in leadership that is built or made to develop and to benefit others. A leadership is then expressed by you serving your gift. In order to serve your gift and find out how you serve your gift and the world that you were created to serve your gift to, you must then find your gift, develop it, and serve it to the world. Each one of us have been gifted with an incredible responsibility uh, that we call life. But also in life, we've been given certain talents and skills that we have the responsibility to steward. Steward so that we find ourselves in, in, a, in an ability to provide or to offer leadership to people so that we can contribute to the very important conversation. Uh, Jesus made the statement in Matthew 23 and 11 that the greatest among you would then be your servant how you serve your gift, how you find your gift, and develop it and serve it to the world, then puts you in the posture of what we can call greatness. Now, I know in the culture we live in, everybody is enamored with being famous. We may not all be famous, but we can all be great. You can be great by simply serving your gift, finding it, mastering it, and then giving it away. Uh, you were created, in fact, in the image of God to to discover your area of gifting and to find it and craft it in such a way that you serve your gift to other people while other people then serve their gift to you. This is what makes humanity go around and everybody is created with giftingness in the image and in the likeness of God. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in that blueprint statement also said, and I say to you young friends that doors are going to open for you, doors of opportunity that were not yet uh, open to your mothers and your fathers and the great challenge facing you is to be ready to face these open doors. And being ready to face the open doors has everything to do with how you skill yourself and equip yourself to master and develop not other people or have dominion over other people, but only over yourself. Uh, this is uh, the responsibility to prepare yourself to create a future that does not exist. It's beautiful that we, that we come to moments like this and we look back in past and we respect the history of how we got here. But more importantly, how do these moments impact us in a way that we create something different moving forward? Uh, that is the responsibility of all creatures and all creation. Your future does not exist yet because you have the responsibility to create it. Uh, we can celebrate what has been done, but that is history. But what we will celebrate out of your life will be a result of what you do with the next opportunity. Uh, what makes us uh, different or, or, uh, or, or distinctive is how we manage or we steward these moments. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King said, and when you discover what you will be in your life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment of history, this moment of history, to do it. Uh, don't just uh, set out to do a good job, but set out to do such a good job that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. Uh, that's the challenge that we're faced with. 
while we celebrate history. I brought my own amen yeah, corner. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> while, we, while we celebrate history, while we celebrate history, let us not celebrate history without the consciousness that we are also called to create history. Uh, it is these moments that we relish in the opportunity to, to raise our consciousness so that we can uh, discover what our contributions are. And that's, in fact, what I'm challenging every person on uh, today. When Dr. King was speaking about this, he himself was standing on the shoulders, just like we stand on the shoulders of those that have gone before us. He was standing on the shoulders of the many contributions that went before him and felt a responsibility to contribute to the narrative. Uh, not just benefit from what was done, but also make sure that he adds something to it. Yes. Uh, that's what I hope today is not just a day where people get out of class or get out of school or an opportunity for them to have a moment or a glance of soberness, but that you would think long and hard today, how tomorrow will you contribute to the conversation? Dr. King uh, was standing with the social consciousness and full awareness of his own legacy and his own history. He knew that his moment in history that God created him for was necessary for him to add value and discover his, diff, his gift and become a leader in his, in his world, in his nation, and to serve his gift. He was standing on the great legacy of people that we often do not hear for because our narrative is usually connected to slavery or injustice that we no longer really hear from the great contributions that were contributed in all of our world. People like W.E. Uh, B. Du Bois, who was an American civil rights activist long before Dr. Martin Luther King, a pan-African sociologist, an educator, a historian, a writer, an editor, a poet, a poet, a scholar, and the founder of the NAACP, who said human nature is not simply an any classifica classification that roughly divides men into good and bad, superior and inferior, slave and free is and must be ludicrously untrue and universally dangerous as a permanent exhaustive classification. He had that in his history. Uh, people like Madam C.J. Walker, who was an American entrepreneur, a philanthropist, regarded as the first female self-made millionaire long before Oprah. Uh, uh, she, in her own words, Madam C.J. Walker started the hair growing business home out of her desire to remedy her own hair loss. She said, I had to make my own living and my own opportunity, but I made it. Don't sit and wait for the opportunities to come. Get up and make them. Uh, this was in his history. People like Garrett Morgan, that every time you stop at a stoplight, you must recognize that he was the contributor because he was made for most uh, notable inventions, included a type of uh, protective respiratory hood, a traffic signal, and hair straightening preparation. His quote was, if you could be the best, then why not try to be the best? Right. That's what he said. People like George Washington Carver, that every time you make a peanut butter jelly sandwich, you ought to thank God for him. Uh, an African-American scientist and inventor, best known for his many uses and devices for the peanut, including dyes, plastic, and gasoline. Hmm. They don't talk about him much, do they? He said, when you can do the common things of life in an uncommon way, you will command the attention of the world. People like Booker T. Washington, uh, who was an African-American educator, an author, an orator, an advisor to presidents of the United States and the founder of, a of the Tuskegee Institute. He said, I shall allow no man to belittle my soul by making me hate him. 
So when you hear Dr. Martin Luther King say like things like, you know, uh, love is the greatest power and I will not let love, uh, let hate be overcome by love. Uh, it is these, these people that he's standing on their shoulders. It is this, his, uh, his language, his contributions was his contribution to the narrative that already preceded him that usually are wiped out of history. So when we first uh, celebrate our heroes, they usually begin with Dr. Martin Luther King in the middle of a struggle, not knowing that his consciousness was coming from a history yeah. and a legacy that was great. Yeah. Every moment is fueling you to the next moment and building you to make sure that you contribute. People like Mary Cloud Bethune, who was an educator and activist, the president of a national association for colored women and founding the National Council of Negro Women, founded Bethune-Cookman College, which is now university, who says faith is the first factor in a life devoted to service. Without it, nothing is impossible. With it, uh, nothing is impossible. Mm -hmm. She literally started her university by making sweet potato pies and serving sweet potato pies to workers until she saved up enough money to start a school. That's the history. And it's still around today. Matter of fact, my wife is a graduate of Bethune-Cookman College. Uh, when you think about this, uh, this is who that uh, when Dr. Martin Luther King jumps into the time of history, he stands into the narrative, having this conversation, having these great speeches and these great clairvoyant moments uh, because he's so gripped with passion by the history that he's come from. And when he's having this dialogue with the students in that moment, he's telling them the issue of identity of who they are, because when they know who they are, then he understands that they they know what they could do. I had an opportunity to go to Ghana a few years back to Africa. And when I went, I was standing here with the bishop, and I was standing there literally at the shores of the Atlantic Ocean uh, where the slave trade uh, took place. It's a place uh, there that's gruesome, and I won't get into all of the details right now. What I will tell you is this door right here is what they call the place of no return. This door is literally the place where uh, Africans were put on a ship and shipped over to America uh, uh, in the slave trade. And when they were pushed through this ship, they called this place the place of no return because the idea was that once they went through, they would never return again. I was stunned as I just stood there and looked and grasped and walked around at these quarters and how it happened. And then while I was standing there filled with emotion, uh, this bishop came up to me and made the statement. He said, listen, I want you to understand something. He said, um, uh, the reason why that in America you guys uh, represent the best and the brightest and the sharpest because you have the blood of the ancestors that did not die in the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. He said all the weak ones, they died. All the weak ones, uh, they jumped ship. They didn't make it. But the ones that made it and that survived are the very best and the brightest. That's why you're the inventors. You're the doctors. You're the lawyers. You're the athletes. You're the you're the leaders, you're the religious leaders, you're the people that make change. And so I want you to make sure that you go to America, tell every black young man, tell every black young woman, tell every person that you meet that the contributions that they have in America are an extension of what began over in Africa. And it did not only begin in, uh, in slavery and during times of injustice, but in fact, it, it began with the rich heritage of kings and people that were inventors and creators. Yeah. This is what Dr. Martin Luther King is standing on and standing for. And so as he stands here, he makes this conversation. Now he asks the question, what is your life's blueprint? He's like, all of those people lived their life already, including him, because six months from this moment, he's murdered. He's assassinated. He said, the best thing that I can tell you to keep the consciousness alive is for you to decide how you'll contribute to the narrative and don't let history be the greatest thing about yourself. Don't let just pain and guilt and shame from what happened because that cannot be changed. What can be changed is what happens next. Right. I want you to just listen for a moment just to this speech. It's just about four minutes, four or five minutes long. Listen to this speech that he's saying and listen alertly because at the end I'm going to engage you in a conversation. And if you don't have questions for me, don't worry, I brought some for you, okay? 
Uh, so I want you to listen to this, this speech as Dr. Martin Luther King asked the question, what is your life's br blueprint? And that's the same question that he's asking us today and that we need to be prepared to answer. I'm going to ask you a question, and that is, what is in your life's blueprint? This is the most important and crucial period of your lives for what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life Yeah. 
Dr. King's words six months before his assassination to a room full of the future, reminding them of their contribution and responsibility inside of your own blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity and self-worth and your own somebodyness. If I were to ask you today, so this moment that we share lives far beyond just a speech, but actually uh, pricks your own heart and your consciousness, how do you consider, what do you consider to be an important contribution in this very important conversation? Anybody brave enough? So many hands everywhere. <laughs> what you say is an important contribution that you would make or need or you see needs to be made in the very important conversation that's been going on for over hundreds of years. Um, I feel like my contribution would be being able to show everyone that nothing cannot be conquered and that anyone can be anything if you put your heart and soul into it. Great. Can you give her a hand, please? She said that her contribution would be that anyone can conquer anything, and that you can't basically lose or defeat it if you put your heart or your soul into it. It's great. Anybody else? I have more questions. Yes? I think what um, both Dr. King and what some of the other um, people were saying before just about how important it is for love to conquer hate. I think it's really important to take that to heart and try to live that out every day. And not just like the idea of it is nice, but to actually implement it into how you speak to one another. Yes. Especially in how polarized our country is today. Yeah. Um, it's such a us versus them mentality. Right. Um, I think it is important to open a dialogue, not just to say that you opened a dialogue, but to really embrace the idea of love and seeing each other as a person instead of just the other side. Love it. Just give her a hand. That's great. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> yes. I was going to say, um, I think one of my duties is to help people uh, see who they are. Um, we've been stripped from knowing who we are. And that's, like you said, it's a part of what we do. So allowing not just us, but children to get to know who, who their roots are. Because when people really find out who they are and where they come from, they're moved by that and they're ready to make a difference. So I think that's one of the things that I'm dedicated to doing is allowing, especially children with this world, because the world is constantly telling them that they're this, but really they're this. So helping them see that they're not what the world wants them to be, but they're who God created them to be. That's good. Right. One more on this question. This statement uh, is so impactful because it speaks to identity. And uh, the more we understand about each other, uh, this, uh, even in our diversity, the more we can respect our differences and see them as strengths, not as weaknesses. And uh, Dr. King is, is speaking to understanding value and self-worth, self -worth, that people are made in the image and the likeness of God. And everybody has purpose. Every life has purpose. And how that purpose is lived or expressed to contribute to a broader conversation. Uh, it's important that we don't continue to just have moments like this where it's all reflective with no revelation with no future tense of what's next or what we are supposed to do, because we just continue to rehearse the past and the history and never feel like we can jump in to contribute to it. That's what's most important. So anytime you are in a room at a college campus with future world leaders and the next generation that have so much to shape, uh, it's always my honor and my privilege to make sure that I, I remind you of your responsibility to add to history, not just reflect on it. 
And uh, some, some of us, it may never be as massive as we see uh, that Dr. King's impact was, but our impact in our own circles can still have uh, such power and such um, points, po poignancy in order to be able to sustain and create change. And so this belief in your own worth or somebodyness uh, is important that we get to know other people that are different from us and uh, know their history and understand um, how God created them to be. Um, when, you, when you think about uh, how you fuel something that you have deep belief in or something that you yourself personally feel like you're called or you're driven to do or to create, like what do you do how do you fuel your own deep belief in or about something? Obviously, Dr. King was fueled by or driven by the responsibility, or even, I dare say, called by God with the responsibility to contribute or to move or to create change or difference. Uh, what do you do with the passions that you possess and how you want to contribute? How do you continue to feed that and fuel that in your own personal life and your relationships? That's question number two. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. I'm fueled by uh, exposure. I'm always learning, listening, meeting new people, doing new things, going to places. And I feel like the more I do that, the more it makes me drive in my mission, in my purpose. It's good. So I'm seeing things, I'm taking them in, and that helps build me up to be able to meet the next hurdle. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Over here. Yes. So I'm fueled by understanding why I'm doing what I'm doing and who I'm meant to help and contribute into in today's society and this world and what I need to give back. So understanding why I'm doing it pushes me and continues for me to go when I get weary. That's great. Thank you so much. Yes. Sorry to go again. No, go again. Um, <laughs> going off of what she was just saying, I think it's important to understand the opposite side too. Mm -hmm. By understand, by like really understanding your own beliefs and by understanding the opposite perspective that can broaden your understanding of the whole situation in general. And I think if you truly do believe in what is right, then by understanding everyone else's perspective, that can better fuel your own belief about mm -hmm. something. That's great. Yes, very important conversation. Thank you. Yes. One more. You see, I'm not afraid of silence. <laughs> One more. Yes. I would say just by action. So if you have a belief about something and you just take one little step towards it, it becomes a little bit more easier to keep following that step than following the people who do that. That's great. Thank you. Yes. What's the most impactful thing out of this short listening to a one time? This is like a 20 minute speech. You can find it on YouTube. This is just like four or five minutes of it. What do you remember most about what was said and, and, and how did it impact you? Do, you? do anyone remember anything about what was said? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the most impactful thing was the talk of knowing what you do and how you need to keep pushing the conversation to make the world a better because we will soon be the people that are doing the work, doing everything, but knowing how to be able to start that dialogue and try to continue the legacy, I feel like was the most important thing about this. Yes. So that's what I got from that. That's great. Thank you. Yes. I think the most important part for me is the fact that he just reminded me like if you can't walk or like if you can't run and walk, if you can't walk and crawl, because I feel like when I want to do something, I try to do it perfectly, and if I can't, then I give up. And yeah. Knowing that doing it the best way I can may not be someone else's best, but mm -hmm. I'm still getting there is inspirational. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Great. I think uh, you always remember that what you wish you could do for many, just do for one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whatever you wish that you can do for many. If you want to be a philanthropist and wish you had millions of dollars to give away, just find one person to contribute to. And it fuels that one opportunity that eventually will grow into what into your true hope and desire. But never talk yourself out of 
doing the little things. Right. The little things matter. Amen. Yeah, it's good. One more? Yes. I would say, uh, with faith, anything is possible. Mm -hmm. Without faith, nothing is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Anybody else? Over here? You have one yes, sir. Um, I don't know the exact words, but you said something like, um, when you feel, don't let someone bring you so low that you hate them. Like, mm -hmm. like well, Lynn kind of would set up with you wash themselves. Yeah. And like with our, the way we, our lives are these days, we can go online and in a matter of seconds find things that start to anger us. Yeah, that's and, right. And it's so easy to respond to those things with hatred. Yeah. And um, so that's kind of the big thing that I'm pulling out of that speech is just to remind myself that if I react to those things more with love, I would be assertive about my beliefs, but react with love, I might find more success. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. True. I think, I think the ownership that Dr. King was giving to this room full of the future of the students was trying to give them a perspective about their own personal re revelation. Uh, so much of our life is lived reactionary and not fueled by our own revelation of our own desires that it's easy that, to let what someone else's actions towards us to shift our, our response back to them instead of understanding what you came here to do what you were created to do, what you came on earth to do, what, you, what your life is a beautiful gift to the world, and this is my intent, and whether you see it, receive it, or appreciate it, I will live my life fueled by that intent, and that's my contribution to the world, as opposed to letting everyone else's opinion or feeling cause a reaction out of my life that's not usually founded or based on truth, but most likely based on ignorance and lies and deceit and misunderstanding. And when we own our own personal uh, uh, responsibility or our own personal blueprint, then we're able to contribute to life with our life and leave legacy. Uh, I no longer am at a place where I can just sit back and celebrate the legacy of others without being conscious of leaving my own legacy. Right. I, I want to stand on the shoulders of the legacies of others, but I have a responsibility to contribute to that narrative and that conversation with every encounter, every friendship, every relationship, and every intent. Other than that, these holidays come and go, and they give us a moment of brevity to feel good because we had a conscious soberness but then we walk away and we go on later today or the next day back to business as usual. That can no longer be. That's how our life ends up in cycles and history continues to repeat itself. Right. Got another question because I still got time. Yes, sir. You got a question or a comment? I think that um, this world is a gift. You should give it all you can. And make a difference. Yeah. Can you stand up so they can see the smartest man in the room? He said, the world is a gift. You should give it all you got. Give it all you can. That's true. That's true. That's the point. <laughs> um, I love the quote that he said, always feel like your life has ultimate significance. We live in a culture that strives for success over significance. Yes, right, right. We, we misalign or mismeasure uh, what success is as opposed to significance. This, this statement always feel like your life has significance. Uh, how do you feel or what do you feel is significant about your life? Significant about your life. I got time. I know you thought you were just going to hear me speak. I want to hear you speak. Anybody? Yes? Um, I think it's important to remember that you're the only one who can live your life. Um, and if you aren't going to do it, no one else will. And you never know who needs you in their life and for what reasons. So you need to be there for them or for whatever else. That's right. That's good. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry. 
ahead and see. Yes. Um, I think that Doesn't really matter how poor or rich, young, old you are, but if you just be, you can do, you can do a lot of you can do a lot of things you thought you couldn't really do. Totally. Mm -hmm. When do you guys enroll in this college? <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear what he said? Yes. Stand up for it. <laughs> he said, say it one more time to the whole room. doctors right now. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, if we could only keep the perspective of a child. The longer we keep the perspective of a child, the best we'll be. That's what Jesus said, right? Must be like a child to get to the kingdom of God because the older we get, the more jaded we become. We lose our lenses of our contribution to the world mm -hmm. or if we really feel like it can map it can matter if we hold on to those perspectives we'll add to the narrative <sighs> he also said the greatest challenge is to be ready to enter doors as they open how do you think that you prepare yourself to both create doors and enter doors that do not exist yet how do you Equip yourselves to be ready. What type of doors even do you think are going to open soon that'll be able to create change? What do you see that's happening now in the world? That's what's needed. Doors that are going to open, doors that create change. I asked it like 15 different ways so you can answer however you want. <laughs> yes? I think it's really important that if you do get to a door and you're able to open the door, that you hold the door open for the people coming in behind you. Um, what a great room. <laughs> good answer. Yeah, that you, if you get to a door, you open a door, you leave the door open for people that's coming after you. Yes. That's contribution. Yes. Yeah, good stuff. Somebody else? Yes? I think just already being so that when someone opens the door, that you already are that, and it doesn't make the transition any harder. Uh, you're prepared. <coughs> you're already prepared. Like, already, ready, so you gotta get already prepared for the door that's coming. What type of doors? Uh, what type of doors do you think are opening? I think, I think that in in those days we saw. Uh, crisis and our ability to contribute to them a lot different than we see it now. Uh, what type of doors do you think are opening that will be opportunities to create change? The next election? <laughs> Thank God. That's Somebody true. Never <laughs> this is true. <laughs> all, all, all our opportunities. All right. yeah. Anybody else? Yes, back here. When we ask somebody a question that we know already has an opposing view, we are already expecting them to answer a certain way, that we're already crafting our own response and not really listening to what they're saying. So good. Or how they're saying it. So for me, I think the challenge is opening the door for active listening and instead of already putting judgment. So good. Thank you. Everybody heard her? <laughs> somebody else? Yes. Um, I think that um, one of my greatest challenges is going to be to use my privilege to push the door open for um, against people who would work to keep that door closed. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yes. Yes. Great challenge. Yes. Yes. Great consciousness. Anybody else? Come on, I figure out of all the places to have this conversation, this would be the world. It's good. Great conversation. What other opportunities do you see coming? Necessary. Yes. I was also thinking about privilege and using the privilege that I have to like build an awareness and like 
put other people's like struggles out there because of course I have my own struggles but other people you know could be like worse off than I am and just like using my privilege to make that more known and bring that to the surface that's great it's great it's great one more What do you think so hard about having the conversation? Is it that you don't know what to say or you don't want to say it? That's a fair question, right? What do you think? Which one is it? Everybody say it at the same time. <laughs> not knowing what to say or not or, or afraid to say it. I think we also have just gotten to a point in time where people are afraid to offend or afraid to say something that won't be accepted. Mm -hmm. And so I think our opening doors is even offering space for people to feel safe mm -hmm. to even have conversations. Exactly. Yeah, I think that people's ability to hear and agree or disagree without attaching that to the person, but leaving that feeling connected to a perspective is gone, which is creating greater ignorance in our in our country and in our world because if we can't share our views or our perspectives right or wrong and still respect someone's difference without attaching it necessarily to that person then we never will learn another side so people feel a way that they never say and when you feel a way that you never say and you just hold it in then eventually that belief can turn into behavior, which then does not create change. And we come to higher levels of institution, educational opportunities, rooms where we are uh, supposed to be learning and exploring and expressing and living out opportunities to create change. Uh, and we end up suppressing new thoughts and new ideas that may be different from our own and then never fully embrace the opportunity to become a catalyst for what's next. Yeah. Yes? Uh, you're talking about the difficulty here and you use the word dialogue. Yeah. So kind of into words, I'm a word nerd. Yeah. And I love that word dialogue because it actually means to talk across. And you were talking about faith and like across it it's painful yeah so like you're really gonna listen to each other like you're really great you're you're asking questions and being vulnerable we can say anything mm -hmm. but that's dialogue right so just to even know that it's gonna hurt but be life-giving in the end like the cross beautiful you know, that's just i don't know that's why it's hard so thank you. beautiful great thank you for that uh that is true <laughs> I don't know, for me, I'm just not afraid of, of um, other, other perspectives or opinions. I think that I know that you asked me to come here to speak, but I think this conversation always ends up being one-sided. I think that we either only hear from Dr. King or we only hear from the person that's talking about Dr. King. Everybody feels a way about what they heard, and then everybody gets up and walks away and never says what they thought about what they heard. Mm -hmm. And every year we do it, over and over and over again. And when it's all said and done, we don't think about, hmm, he has a blueprint, I have a blueprint, he lived his life, it's over, I have to live my life now. How do I, do I even feel like my life is wanting to contribute to this conversation? Or, hey, I don't really want to contribute to that conversation. I know that's a conversation that's happening and it's going on and I don't want to feel anywhere about it and I, I want this to be over so that I don't have to do anything about that because it's history or it's now or it's far away or it's on the news or it's not my friends or it's not my family or maybe, hey, I really feel driven or fueled to be responsible for being a part of this or being involved in this. Either way, at some point we have to make a decision about the information that we hear and how, it, how we experience it and how, we, how it impacts us or else we'll just continue to wait for next year for the next March. Mm -hmm. Yes? I have a question about something you just said and anybody in the room who has insight on this. Say you have people in your life that you care about, friends, family, whatever, who do feel that way. Like, that doesn't affect me, so I don't want to get involved with it. I don't even want to sit in the room and hear somebody else's perspective. Does anybody have any 
like good tips or like how to really engage that person and also like keep your own cool when you're like so frustrated. It's like, no, you should care about this though, even if it doesn't directly affect you. Great question. Your hands. Anybody want to answer it before me? Yes. I was going to say, I was just about to say something about that. We need to get to a point where we realize, because the reality is we are the body of Christ. We are not, we're, we all have a thing that we do in this life, but we're all doing it together as one. So my issue is his issue. His issue is my issue. So I can't say that doesn't mean anything to me because I'm not related to that topic, but the reality is it is my issue. So if we begin to understand that when our friend or our neighbor has a problem, that it is our issue, then things will begin to change. We, we have this idea or this mentality that it's I, 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 but the reality is it's not I. It's not about us at all, actually. It's about God, and we have to remember that. And once we get to the point where we remember that, we're reminded that this is all of our struggle, and we have to work together to get through these things. She, looked like she was passionate about that. <laughs> See, and I slightly disagree. Because I feel like that just because it's an issue is not everyone's cause. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that the Bible does say that love your neighbor as yourself, so what affects my neighbor should affect me, but everybody doesn't live their, their life by that principle. That's true. So trying to get people to live a principled path that don't live a principled path and become frustrated because they're not principled on the same thing. Your principle is a waste of your principle. Right. Right. And actually, <laughs> and actually, actually, you end up redoing what they're doing to you right. by trying to diminish the fact that they're not passionate about your passions. Whatever they're unpassioned, unimpassioned about, you can also then just let that be an awareness that, hey, they're just one of a thousand of a hundred thousand people that probably don't even care about this conversation. Look how big this campus is. I applaud every person that's in this room. But look how big this campus is. Where is everybody else? It's just not their issue. It's not their cause. They're like, I'm not walking. It's freezing. It's 10 below outside. You, this ain't Selma. This is Grand Rapids. I'm not walking around. I'm not walking around the campus, reading little known facts, going to hear this yeah. preacher guy talk about Martin Luther King. I'm not doing it. It's nothing wrong because that's not what they want to do. Right. It's just not their cause. Right. Because movements don't begin in crowds. They begin in rooms. And so it doesn't always take everybody. What it does take is somebody to believe in their somebodyness. Yeah. And be able to agree to disagree that what you care about, because because even though you and I may agree and care about some things, there are many things that you care about that I do not care about. I only care about them because they matter to you. When you get married, guess what? Your spouse will not care about everything you care about. <laughs> There's going to be some stuff that you care about. My wife is here. She care about stuff. I don't care about. I care about stuff she don't care about. There are things with people that you love deeply that they just don't care. Don't you care? <laughs> Don't you care that the dishes are empty before you go to bed? No. <laughs> I don't care. But they care deeply about it. Do I get a divorce over dishes? Absolutely not. I try to learn to care about what she cares about. And if I can't learn to care about what she care about, I fake it until I can. <laughs> Because either I can be right or I can be married. Right. <laughs> okay. and, so, and so our reality is in the world that we live in, unfortunately, some people just don't care. Now what I did learn in marriage, in life, and in relationship is usually when people don't care, you know what it is? It's ignorance. Yeah. And ignorance seems to be like an offensive word, but really is, I just don't know. I don't know why that matters so much to you. And sometimes if we spend more time helping people understand why it matters, and less time trying to make it matter because it matters, then that becomes a principle instead of a preference. Yeah. Right. And we try to get people connected to our preferences and not our principles. So if I help you understand why and see, maybe you'll see, maybe you'll never see, it never will change it for me. Okay? Good.
great question. Yeah. Now we're getting somewhere. The room is warm. <laughs> He's giving me the cold shoulder 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm not afraid. You can even ask me a question if you have one. No? Yes? What do you think Martin Luther King Jr.'s greatest accomplishment was for what you what was his life? I think his greatest accomplishment was living his life on purpose. Mm -hmm. Against all opposition, against fear, against threats. I, I feel like he took his gifts, his talents, he served them to the world, he gave his life to God and to people. And wherever that took him, that was his greatest accomplishment. Now, in that was a bunch of things that we can check off but ultimately it had nothing to do with that as much as it had to do with a life lived on purpose. Yeah. And I think that's what we can take from his life is, let's live life on purpose. Yeah, great question. Okay. That's my question. What you think? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> She's like, move out the way. <laughs> what is your contribution that you want to leave? It's my last question. Anybody? Even if it changes later. I want to be able to help in whatever way I can. Like, I'm trying to be a good person. You want to be able to help in whatever way you can. Gotcha. And do whatever is needed to just make people smile. I want to be able to be known by my ability to help others. That's sweet. Great mission. Anybody else? Yes. You want to help the homeless. Another genius. <laughs> Give them a doctor. <laughs> Anybody else? Contribution. Yes. I want to um, be. I, I want to leave a legacy of helping uh, veterans because there's so many veterans that are unhelped, and um, being able to create jobs and opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. And we, I'm working on that right now. And just to be able to, when they come back, not to forget about them and they become homeless and for our people to just make sure that we love one another and understand each other's culture so a veteran does not have to be de uh, de deported through ISIS because he was at a mental state. So that's what I'm hoping to be able to change. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Let's give everybody a good hand today. What would our life in our space be like if these were the conversations we had over coffee? Yeah. Not, not talking about people or even talking about events, but what kind of contributions we want to make in the world. And uh, people actually felt empowered to do so. Um, when, you, when you think about it, I, I want you to consider in, in the blueprint that to be a catalyst takes three things. Just if you're writing it down, write these three, down, three things down for me. Number one, to be a catalyst for change takes courage. It takes courage and courage is the ability to confront the need for change. It takes courage. Courage is the ability to confront the need for change. Number two, it takes conviction. And conviction is the ability to show others that they need to change or inspire people to change. Number three, it takes confidence. And confidence is to lead people in the process of change, to implement change. So as we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King's extraordinary life, 
make sure that you live your extraordinary life. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. today. You thought we were having a speaker, we were having a facilitator of dialogue. We're sneaky like that. Um, we would like to once again say thank you so much to Pastor Glenn. Um, we'd like to thank our many, many campus partners who made this um, possible, uh, this day of celebration, marketing and communications, campus safety, CORE, Sister Mary Ann, Father Stan, and all of you. Thank you for getting out in the cold, Thank you for taking some time of, of your day to be with us. Um, today is a celebration, but it's a challenge. You are challenged in this room. You're challenged to go forth from here. What is your purpose? What is your contribution? This is a fabulous time in life to think about those questions and to make some real power moves to make it happen. And we really, really hope that we can be a part of that for you. Um, we would love if you could take a brief moment. Um, we've passed out some feedback forms. That always helps us. We want to best serve you. Thank you for sticking with us through our kind of IT little issue today. We really appreciate it. Happy Martin Luther King Day, everybody. Thank you.